So very roughly speaking, um, generally, uh, physicalism is the view that only physical things exist. And by physical things, we mean something in particular. We mean those things which are postulated by a completed physics. So currently, these kinds of things involve the things that you'll see on your screen here, sort of um, a, a version of the standard model of particle physics, uh, um, postulating the various um, um, pro particles out there and their properties and the way that they interact. So uh, now this is not to say that this is the completed version um, or that any of these things are going to make it into the completed version, but the physicalist is committed to the view that ultimately whatever our completed microphysics tells us um, reality uh, is composed of, then that's what exists. So now you might say, well, gee, well, what about the ordinary tables and chairs uh, and furniture of our ordinary day-to-day -day life? So here's, you know, modernist tables and chairs, but also there's me um, playing the drums uh, um, with my consciousness collective in New York at the Parkside Lounge uh, and occasionally other places. So um, what about those things? Do they exist? Well, of course, the physicalist thinks that, they, that those things exist, but they do so because they are composed of the fundamental elements that physics talks about, so um, and completely and exhaustively composed of them. Um, so at the at the a, a substructure level, then everything is built out of this stuff and completely exhausted by this stuff. Those are the things which exist according to the physicalists. Now this commits them to a couple of views. So here's Hakuan Lao, the leader of the seminar, and his. Um, uh, uh, lab assistant Sarah in the background singing there, um, again at Parkside. So consider uh, then, um, in the philosophy of mind, physicalism commits us to the view that um, where there's conscious experience, it's just something ultimately reducible to physics, uh, ex explanatorily, and so that we're ultimately be able to deduce just from the physical properties, um, the qualitative properties. Now, not all physicalists agree that this is the case. So Ned Block famously disagrees. He thinks that you can't do this even though he's a physicalist. But I'm willing to um, grant that for the purposes of our discussion today, um, that the physicalist is committed to there being this kind of deduction um, in principle from uh, the completed physics to qualitative properties and vice versa. Okay, so now also something that physicalism is committed to is a modal thesis or a thesis about the space of possible worlds. And what that entails is that if there were a duplicate of our world at the microphysical level, then that would be a duplicate period or simpliciter. So um, here again is a microphysically, um, a world microphysically identical to our world. And there's Hakuan and Sarah again, um, enjoying the nice qualitative experience they do. And this world is microphysically identical to ours. So that's what the physicalist is committed to. Now, of course, there are some well-known problems with physicalism, um, and these are philosophical problems uh, a priori, which supposedly um, there are objections to this thesis uh, based merely on um, certain uh, a conceptual analysis of consciousness and an, uh, uh, intuitions that are generated in the armchair. So here's the first of which. They say, well, look, it certainly seems conceivable that you have a world that's microphysically identical to the actual world, but where there just isn't any conscious experience. So that's what Dave Chalmers has called the zombie world. So the zombie argument then has this following structure. It starts from the premise that zombies are conceivable. You can imagine this zombie world, a world physically just like ours but without consciousness. Well, given that and some other plausible assumptions, which I'm going to grant for the purposes of our discussion, uh, it therefore, therefore possible, there is a possible world out there where there are zombies, and it follows from that that physicalism is false. Now, there's another well-known argument against physicalism. Um, this was originally formulated uh, um, by in its current form by Peter Jackson, although it has an anticipations and people going as far back as C.D. Broad and um, even as far back as uh, um, people who were objecting to Hobbes in the 1600s. So we don't have to worry about that stuff. But so here's the way it's put currently. So imagine a, a super scientist named Mary. She's a genius. She's kept in a black and white room for her entire life, raised in this black and white room. She's never allowed to see color, 
but she's taught all of the physical facts. Now, not just our standard model of physics, but whatever, you know, the ultimate complete grand unified theory of physics is after we've um, unified quantum mechanics and relativity physics and we understand everything there is to know about the physical world, she learns that, but she's never seen colors before. So then one day you bring in a red ripe tomato into her room and people have this idea, this intuition that she's going to learn something, something that she might express by saying, oh, so that's what it's like to see red. And of course, that's supposed to be bad because um, she knew all of the physical facts. So she knew all of the physical facts, but she didn't know what it was like to see red. Um, it seems to follow that what it's like to see red isn't deducible from the physical facts themselves. And that's, of course, as we were just saying before, something that the physicalist is committed to and something that I'm going to grant, that the physicalist does have to say that there are these a priori deductions. So here's the way that Chalmers puts the argument. And it's slightly different than the way uh, Jackson originally formulated it. Um, but um, it, it, it puts it in terms of deduction, which I find useful. So um, let's put it this way. So the first premise says that the connection between the physical and the qualitative is not a priori, right? That's just the intuition you're supposed to have in the Mary case. Mary can't deduce, she can't know what it's like to see red simply on the basis of knowing all the physical facts. So now the second premise says, well, if that's the case, then the connection between them is contingent. Um, therefore, physicalism is false. So you notice that these two arguments have a common structure. There's some kind of conceivability claim. You imagine something, you have an intuition, um, and then there's a possibility claim that that follows from that, therefore this thing is possible, um, and then uh, the conclusion. So depending on how, how you object to the argument, Chalmers classifies you as being a certain kind of physicalist. So People who deny the first premise, namely that zombies are conceivable, are what uh, Dave calls uh, type A dualists. So a type A dualist canonically and typically uh, are people like Churchland and Dennett. Um, and they just say, look, given what we know now, zombies are not conceivable. We can just see they're not conceivable. Um, we, we can, uh, and, and that's usually because they end up defining consciousness in, in terms of some functional activity or something like that. Um, and uh, they're usually a limitivists about the notion of phenomenal consciousness. And both, those, both, of, the, both of those things are bad. We're going to come back to that later, but uh, let me just note that right now. <clears throat> Excuse me. Both those things are bad. Okay, so then there's the second group, uh, which is the most popular, and I jokingly say that's everyone else. It's probably not every, everyone else, but significant number of philosophers take this route. So the type B person agrees that there's um, th that the zombies are conceivable uh, and that the Mary intuition is strong, that she learns something. Um, but then they go on to, to deny the connection between conceivability and possibility. So sure, they say it's conceivable, you imagine something, but what does that show us about the way reality could be, about what's possible? Um, so they deny the connection between conceivability and possibility. So the type C people uh, sort of straddle the line uh, of take the best of both worlds. And of course, that's going to be a problem. We'll see later if it can be overcome or not. But um, anything that tries to get the best of both worlds intuitively seems like it might have problems with being a stable position. So we'll come back to that. So the type C physicalist says, look, certainly seems like zombies are conceivable. Certainly seems like Mary would learn something or wouldn't be able to deduce these uh, one thing from the other. So it, it seems like she would learn something, and so these things are not deducible. But of course, seemings are fallible, as we have too often in the past been reminded of. So while it may seem that way, that doesn't mean that it's actually that way. So we invoke a distinction between what Dave Chalmers calls prima facie conceivability, where prima facie, just Latin for an effort's blush, or um, so yeah, sort of intuitively at first sight, these things are uh, appear conceivable, but on ideal reflection, they may not actually um, really turn out to be conceivable.